all the final day participants, otherwise known as short timers. Um, as you think about do what you're doing the rest of the day, um, driving up over Loveland Pass or taking the lift at Keystone, which is a fantastic thing to do this afternoon, we are, one of our jobs is to make it as hard as humanly possible for you to sneak out early. And we think we've done a good job of that um, with the speakers that we have today. Amy mentioned one of our goals this morning. Um, we, we, there actually is a plan to the program. Um, it's not just a series of random unfortunate events. We um, have a progression and we've gone from the first day's progression of trying to connect values to systems. What values do we want to bring into our systems of hospitals, into our systems of insurance? And how can we make sure that we're confirming those values every day and improving those systems? Yesterday we talked about connecting our values to communities and neighborhoods and we had some amazing speakers talking about that. How do we make sure that we're not just telling communities what to do, that we're listening to them first and then helping them find their values and then working along with them to promote those values every day. Today we're trying to connect values to actions and our speakers were chosen very specifically to talk about that because of the work that they've done and some of the amazing things they've done out in the world. So we're gonna start with Nancy Lublin who has done this many times, uh, multiple times in her career which um, seems short in some ways but is so effective in many other ways in terms of a, a global view of how to identify your values and sort of use the world as it is and using technology which presents this picture of sometimes alluring but sometimes terrifying, frankly, text, digital information running around the world at the speed of light and what can you do with that information and sort it out and use it instead of just complaining about it and complaining about how technology is driving us crazy. Use it to promote your values and do some good for the world. Now we're gonna step down a little bit to Dr. Elizabeth Ryder who has brought her amazing research about interpersonal communication, especially among doctors. And Dr. Ryder will tell you um, that she's not only a doctor, it's just as important that she is a social worker and that fact of interpersonal communication and how important that is still in this digital world to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation and that you can study it and that you can teach people how to do that better and you can quantify whether you've done that is what she'll be talking about today. And then finally, we're gonna have Victor Strecker who has been a successful digital entrepreneur in his own right, a very highly respected academician at University of Michigan, but uh, is setting that aside a little bit today to talk about something very personal that happened with him um, and the most significant and horrifying tragedy that can happen to any parent um, that happened in his life and um, how he's tried to use that, translate that into finding what values were important to him despite all the great work that he's done, had he really attached his own values to that work. And then working with us as he sends us out the door today to think about how we could do that with ourselves and is gonna go through an exercise with um, helping us find the values that are important to us and bringing that to our work. So first, we're gonna talk about this thing that we all have in our pockets, in front of us on the counter, um, that we have kind of an ambivalent relationship with. When you get a text coming in from your son's baseball game, that's a great thing, it's a lot of fun. Um, when I press that button and I look at my email comes up, the first email on my list is from Dr. Rob Lustig, and it's a bit terrifying, frankly, because <laughs> I'm wondering what he's gonna be yelling at us about in this email. Um, <laughs> probably a lot. Uh, something that I haven't thought of that's dangerous to me and that I should be doing. Um, so this idea of technology and how we use it and when, it's, we're, when we're looking at it, it's a great thing. It brings all this information to us and we're having fun looking at websites and, and doing all the things we want to do. That's fun. When somebody else is using it and you're trying to talk to them, your kids, for example, or maybe your spouse, um, and they're looking at it like this and you're trying to have the conversation with them, uh, it could be incredibly annoying and you start to wonder and we should all ask ourselves this question right now. Overall, is this a force of good in the world or a force of not so good in the world? And you can look at it that way or you could do what Nancy Lublin has done, which is to say, it's here to stay. We've all got it. We're all gonna keep using it. So what can we actually do with it that supports our values and takes that out into the world? And it's not the first time she's done this with the crisis text line, which she'll be talking about today. Um, she, before she had done it, 
Uh, soon after graduating from college, she had a $5,000 inheritance, and there was something else that was bothering her. It was bothering her that when she heard someone say that it's important when you go in for a job interview that the interviewer judges women especially by how they present themselves, how they look. And that seems unfair. Why do we do that? Um, you can complain about that all day. It's going to be very hard to change. So instead of complaining about it, she took this $5,000 inheritance and worked with other people and created Dress for Success, which is a literal closet of clothing that women can come in and use for job interviews. And along with that, because you can sometimes use a lot more than just the dress or the power suit, um, training on how to do better interviewing, how to become a better, uh, present yourself better when it's such an important thing as a job interview. Um, that wasn't enough. Nancy then moved on when an organization called DoSomething.org was in crisis and needed help. And they, were, they had had great success up to that point connecting young people who had entrepreneurial social ideas, nonprofit ideas. They were excited about volunteering or starting a new nonprofit. But they didn't quite have all the connections they needed. And DoSomething.org was a social media and digital connection to get them attached to it. But they were financially failing. Nancy came on board with that, got them back on their feet financially. Instead of just saying, you know, we're a failure, why, how did this happen? She got it back on its feet. Um, as part of doing that work, some of her employees and colleagues would do something.org were using social media a lot and were on their cell phones a lot and using smartphones. And they were starting, they would see texts come in from teenagers that were strangers to them, but were expressing the most personal and in sometimes terrifying information about themselves, um, about suicidal thoughts or um, feel, uh, family abuse, um, things that they were worried about. And this, they came to Nancy and said, we feel like we, there's something we should be doing about this. There should be something, somebody on the other end of this thing that is listening to them with grace, with care, and with knowledge about what maybe they could do next to work on their situation. And so, she founded Crisis Text Line um, to take in all these texts and you know, sort them out, try to connect them with people. She'll tell us a lot more about that. Please do not rush the stage when you see the data that Nancy has available uh, that she's aggregated. I had a glimpse of it back there. It's truly amazing stuff, and I'm sure you guys will have a lot of questions about that. So texting is here to stay. Uh, the first text was sent in 1992. And it was sent by a British computer geek from a computer to a nearby cell phone. Um, after thousands and thousands of years of hum human evolution and thinking about it, all the best message they could come up with for the first text ever was Merry Christmas, um, which was immediately followed two seconds later by the second text, which was, who cares about Christmas? Have you seen those cat videos on YouTube, LOL. <laughs> and then it just took off from there. Now there are six billion texts a day, is that about right, Nancy? Um, running around just in the US, and the median amount of texts sent by a teenager is 60. So that's the world we're dealing with. What can you do with that world? Um, as much as it drives you nuts when your own kids are doing it, maybe there's some way that can be harnessed. And so Nancy is here to talk to us about using the world as it is for connecting your values to doing something good. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. So I am not ambivalent about your mobile phone. I think it's awesome. <clears throat> and I think we can save a lot of lives with it. <clears throat> I'm actually kind of in love with my cell phone. Um, how many of you have teenagers? Stand up if you have a teenager. OK. Now stay standing if you can remember the last time you actually spoke to your teenager by phone. <laughs> right, most of you just text with your teenagers, right. So in my job at DoSomething.org, um, which actually earlier this week eclipsed four million members, it is the largest uh, organization, member organization for young people and social change in the country. Um, it's actually bigger than the Boy Scouts. Um, we like to say maybe because it's, we're not homophobic. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but um, <laughs> so, uh, 
So uh, it is the largest organization for young people in the country. And so it made sense to us that the way we should be communicating with young people is the way that you communicate with young people and the way they communicate with each other. And so he's right. We text. We text with young people. Every week, we text with them. What Do Something does is campaigns. There are more than 200 live campaigns on the site right now. Um, and we send them out messages encouraging them to do these campaigns. A campaign to us is something that doesn't require money, an adult, or a car. Because you can't assume that a young person has access to any of those things. So we'll do a campaign like uh, around hunger. We'll call the food pantries all over the country and say, what do you need? Everyone collects soup for you. Do you really need canned soup? And they laugh and say, no, we need protein, as some of you probably know. We need protein, non-perishable protein, peanut butter. So we said, OK, we've got you. We do a campaign called the PB and Jam Slam. And the whole thing is, are you team crunchy or team smooth? So who is team smooth? Yeah, you're correct. OK, so, uh, <laughs> so two thirds of the country apparently is smooth. Um, anyway, so we do a whole, a whole campaign around this. And in the span of a month, we collected over 200,000 jars of peanut butter. So these, are, these are very big campaigns. You haven't had your coffee. You can clap for that. That was good. OK. <laughs> so these are really, really big campaigns. And so text message is effective in reaching out to them. He's right. Uh, text messaging has a 97% open rate. You open every text you get. It over-indexes minority and urban. You can look at some of the data that Pew puts out. And we found that it is 10 to 30 times more powerful to reach out to a young person by text than it is by email. Um, so those of you who have your computers open, do me a favor, go to Google and in search, type in email is for and just shout out what the autofill is. Email is for forever, no, no, for, or email is, just write an email is and you'll see what it pops up. Are you laughing? It usually says email is for old people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's usually what search tells you there in Google. Anyway, OK, so, um, so we text a lot. And, and he's right. We started getting, uh, having this unintended consequence. Every time we'll send out a text message about, say, the PB and Jam Slam, we will get messages back that we call out of flow. They have nothing to do with hunger, smooth, crunchy, peanut butter, but things like, I'm being bullied and I don't want to go to school tomorrow. Or I think I might be addicted to crystal meth. And we were triaging these. Here's a hotline number. Here's a website. Please go talk to your principal. <clears throat> and then we got a message that made us really just stop in our tracks. And it said exactly this. He won't stop raping me. It's my dad. He told me not to tell anyone. And then the letters, are you there? And the person who ran mobile messaging in my office brought it into my office, closed the door, and said, I, I don't know what to do with this. I mean, it felt like being punched in the stomach. We, we were so shocked that this could just happen at all, let alone that someone could be so desperate to turn to us to send it to strangers who really don't have expertise in this. And so I said, send her the hotline for Rain. That's the rape and incest organization. And we did. And I came in the next morning and said, did we hear back from her? No. I said, send it again. And I will tell you that we've actually never heard back from her. I don't know where she is. I don't know if she's alive. Um, I don't know if she ever got help. Um, and I talk about her and I tell her story everywhere I do public speaking because I hope she sees what her desperation and frankly her courage inspired. Because it was after that that I looked at my team and said, we need to do something else here. Clearly they want these kinds of services by text. And so it was right after that that I started doing two jobs. While running Do Something, I started working on this as a startup um, crisis text line and providing support by text. Our two-year anniversary of launching is actually tomorrow. So yeah. <laughs> yep. And we launched it really quietly. We pulled 4,000 members from Do Something from the database in Chicago and 4,000 from El Paso. And we sent them a message that said, if you were some, there's this new service. If you or someone you know needs help, here's the number. So you have to re-opt in. And in four months, we were in all 295 area codes in the United States. So that's faster than when Facebook first launched and spread around the country. 
And we did this with zero marketing. On one hand, you think, wow, well, if I was selling donuts, I would be really excited about that because I'd be rich. Um, but this is sad. This is spread because this is all word of mouth. This is young people telling other young people, hey, I know you're in pain, and here's this service available um, for you. It's, it's powerful how quickly we've grown. We are now handling more than 20,000 messages a day. So let's talk about text. Um, when we first built this, um, we thought that our primary user was going to be the texter. And my first two hires were a chief technology officer and a chief data scientist. And I sent them on the road. And they went and they did about 100 visits around the country to look at call centers and how people typically do mental health and crisis work. And they said, our customer is not actually the texter. Our primary is the crisis counselor. And how easy is this system for the crisis counselor? They are the caregivers. They're on the front lines. How easy is it for them? And so we originally had designed the whole platform. We first built our logo. You know, that's what you do with a startup. You have your logo. Ironically, like your, it looks like your badges, guys. It's red with white letters. And so we built the whole platform to look like that. And when they went out and did user testing, they noticed that our crisis counselor's eye was going up to the top left corner where the logo was because it looked like a big red button. So we called some psychiatrists and some experts and said, what is the most calming color? And they said, it's a cool slate blue. So we redesigned the entire platform around a cool slate blue. That's just kind of one example of what it means to be user-centric, to make sure that your caregivers are in the best possible situation to deliver care. The second thing we, we did and we learned was we originally thought we were just the technologists. I am not a mental health expert, but I know how to build tech platforms and do social change. And I thought we would just be the pipes. And we put out an RFP, and we hired three crisis centers around the country to do the responses. And quickly, the volume grew, and, and we were at 11 crisis centers to handle the responses. And what we realized was all of these crisis centers were using volunteers also. And they all had different trainings. Some of these crisis centers had as a policy to ask every single texter, are you feeling suicidal today? Well, I was texting in about having my first crush on a girl. I wasn't feeling suicidal until you asked me, should I be feeling suicidal? <laughs> um, uh, they had best practices that had existed for 40 and 50 years based on academic research, like never use I statements as a counselor. Never say I. Never put yourself in the mix. And I said, well, what does the data say about this? And so we created what we referred to as the 12th cohort, the, the 12th man. The 12th cohort, that was a, 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 a sport reference. OK, I'm going to avoid sport references. OK, so we created the 12th man. And, um, and we created this volunteer cohort. And we designed this based on scraping all the best practices we had seen on the site. So for example, we had them test sprinkling an I statement every once in a while. Turns out it's three times more powerful. That as the, count, the crisis counselor, if you just say, I feel that, or I had that happen to a friend once, just sprinkle it in there. It is three times more powerful. And the texter will just send back then a slew of rapid response because you just established trust. So we trained this volunteer cohort. It was a 35-hour training. You do it online. It involves role plays, quizzes, readings, and uh, 10 modules. And because we cover every issue, the depression module has been reviewed by multiple academics, multiple organizations. So instead of picking one organization's philosophy, we're calling best practices from everyone. So that's what we learned in building it. Now let's, let me tell you about how the service is going. I already told you about the scale. Why is this growing so quickly? Because it's really kind of awesome. It turns out that counseling by text is pretty fantastic. So first of all, it's private. Nobody overhears you talking. So we spike every day at lunchtime. During lunch, we see increases because your teenagers are sitting there at lunch texting us. Their friends think they're texting some cute boy across the cafeteria. They're actually texting us about the anxiety attack they're feeling because they have a calculus exam that afternoon. And, and in, in fairness, uh, the issues that we're seeing are not really about crushes on boys and exams. 30% of our messages are about suicide and depression. When it's private and it's a trusted mechanism, they tell you everything. 
We have long-term engagement um, because we keep your whole record there. You text in and it basically becomes an account. We encrypt it for privacy and security reasons, but if you do text back a few weeks later, your whole history is there. So instead of having to say, what's your name? What's going on? We know who Joe is. Joe is your abusive boyfriend who you're trying to get away from. We have that whole history there. We have a word cloud of the most possible popular words that you've used. The communication is clear. We don't get the words, um, like. We don't get hyperventilating. We don't get crying. We get facts. And we don't get repetition of those facts. It's actually an incredibly effective communication platform. We're able to handle spikes in volume. When Zane left One Direction, for the three nights after that, I mean, come on, some of you in the room remember when Duran Duran broke up. You shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> OK, you were upset too. This is a real thing. For these, these One Direction fans, Zane leaving One Direction was a very real traumatic experience. Um, the hashtag cut for Zane trended worldwide. These were girls who were inflicting real self-harm, posting photos, posting the hashtag, because they believed that maybe he would rejoin the band if they did. We saw spikes for three nights after that. More anxiety more self-harm texts coming in. Now, phone hotlines, emergency rooms, you have to call in more bodies to help triage spikes in volume. Our platform is such that our crisis counselors can handle three to four people at a time. So we're actually built to handle a spike. Also, you don't have to physically go anywhere. Our crisis counselors can do this from home. So actually, on Monday night, we had a spike. Um, Fox News did a nice story on us. And uh, we had 80 people text into the platform within three, five minutes. And so that was a, a huge spike. We sent out, uh, our algorithm reads that. I'm going to talk about the data in a minute. The algorithm reads that, and we send out an alert to our spike team. They climbed on the platform, and within 30 minutes, we were down to eight people. It was really, really powerful. We're able to handle spikes like that because it's text. Time of day reference, the number one word they use is the word today. They use that six times more than any other time of day reference like last week or yesterday or last month, which means we are getting them in the moment of crisis, and especially for young people, to be doing crisis intervention in the decision-making moment, we can be most impactful. Today I felt like cutting again. Today I felt like swallowing these pills. Today I was really angry and I didn't know how to control it. We also over-index Hispanic and urban. That launch that I told you about in Chicago and El Paso, we saw three times the usage in El Paso as Chicago. Here's the kicker, we don't offer our service in Spanish. So even in English, we're seeing far greater usage in low-income communities where they're less likely to have guidance counselors, family shrinks, or frankly, a cultural history of reaching out for help and talking about these feelings. Here's another unintended consequence. We are seeing a lot of deaf and hard of hearing texting in, which is really powerful. And I'll confess, I never thought of that. People with cerebral palsy, people with stuttering are using our service. And maybe more exciting than that, they're applying to be crisis counselors. So instead of being the victims or being the people who need to be helped, they're applying to be the people to offer help, which is incredibly empowering. We have messages like this. I'll tell you one story. Uh, someone texts in, I want to die. We go through a risk assessment. That's ideation. Do you have the plan is basically the next thing the crisis counselor figures out. Yes, I, I, I will I'm going to take some pills. Then we figure out, do they have the, the means? Are they, do they have it then? And what's the time reference? I have the pills on the desk in front of me. The crisis counselor says, how about you put the pills in the desk drawer while we're texting? and alerts 911 while doing this. Now, if you text a crisis text line, you want help. So when we ask, where are you, we'd like to send help, most of the time they do. Sometimes they don't, and we send help anyway. We contact 911 at that point. 911 works with the mobile carriers and us, and we triangulate and find out where you are. In this instance, she did tell us her address. We sent uh, an ambulance and police. 
But all of a sudden, the text messages went silent. And for 23, probably of the longest minutes this crisis counselor has ever experienced, 23 minutes, there was nothing. And then the next message came in, again, same account. This is the mom. I was in the house. I had no idea. We're in the ambulance on our way to the hospital now. Thank you. I mean, as a parent, I, I choke up every time I think about that one. And then a month later, a message from that same account that said, I just got out of the hospital, I was diagnosed as bipolar, and I think I'm going to be OK. Now, I'd love to tell you, yeah. I'd love to tell you that messages like that are unusual. We're doing three active rescues a day. These are actually quite common. Self-care for our crisis counselors. I know the next speaker is going to talk about um, inter interpersonal uh, between caregivers, so I'm going to throw this out there for her. Self-care of these crisis counselors is of the utmost importance for us. So in our platform, we actually built a chat function so that counselors can talk to other counselors. So you're dealing with something that triggers something in you, or you need a bathroom break, or you just don't know the best thing to respond to this texture, you can open up a chat function. For those of you whose Gmail, it looks a lot like Gchat, or Facebook, it looks like Facebook Messenger. And you can talk to other counselors who are on the platform at the same time. You're both looking at the same thread from the texture and deciding together how best to respond. It's like having a, a team of people assess your case and make sure you're getting the best care and so they feel supported. So this is all great, and we're helping people one at a time and saving lives. And if that's all it was, it would still be a fantastic service. But the part that really gets me hot and sweaty is the data. So let's talk about the data, OK? Because the data has the potential to prevent this stuff from ever happening. Right? If we know the triggers for these issues, if we know neighborhoods where there are acute problems, we can put policies and people in place to prevent the stuff from happening. So let's talk first about how the data is making us better, and then let's talk about how the data is making the world better. OK, how the data makes us better. We can take you in order of severity. We should operate. Crisis lines should operate like an emergency room. You come in with a gunshot wound, you should be taken before the sprained ankle. So when you text in, I want to die, I want to kill myself, the algorithm reads that, makes you code orange, and you become number one in our queue. We take you first, as we should. The second thing that makes us better is we are using AI and natural language processes to auto-tag all of the words in real time. This is a very large data set. What you want from a data set, in order to be a good data set, if you want to impress your friends and family this weekend, if you want a great data set, you need three things. Volume, velocity, and variety. That is what makes a great data set. We have that. Doing 20,000 messages a day, we have volume, velocity, and variety. And so we've layered on something called a bag of words algorithm, and we can now do some really interesting predictive work. So let's take a step back for a, seven, a second. Chances are in this room, someone here has at some point in time seen a marriage counselor or a shrink. You don't need to raise your hand on this one. But at some point in time, someone here has. So I'll, my, my husband's um, not here, so I'll throw myself under the bus. So um, we saw a marriage counselor at one point, and our first meeting, she looked at us and said, OK, guys, I'll see you both in two weeks. Jason, I'll see you next week alone. And we walked out, and I looked at him, and I was like, she's brilliant. She's great. I love this marriage counselor. <laughs> so, how do you know your marriage counselor or shrink is any good? Maybe she went to Harvard and you're really impressed by that. Maybe she graduated in the bottom 10% of her class from Harvard. You don't know. Uh, maybe her degree was from 50 years ago and she kind of hasn't kept up really with best practices. Should it take you know, five years to cure your foot fetish or five weeks? You really have no way of knowing. We have the data to know what makes a great crisis counselor. So this bag of words algorithm, if you text in the words numbs, I'm going to start you on easy ones. Numbs and sleeve, 90% match for something. Can you guess the issue? Cutting, yes. OK, you text in the words MG and rubber band, 90% match for something. MG is short for milligram. Milligram and rubber bands. Heroin, yep. OK, you text in the words sex, Oral and Mormon, 90% match for something. Your male, 
and your LGBTQ questioning. Okay, you text in the word torture, 90% match for something. Torture is slang for bullying. I feel tortured, they torture me at school. So this algorithm is smart enough to read even the slang. Think about what you can do with an algorithm like that. This is not robots replacing humans. This is not like Terminator territory. This is the algorithm making humans faster and smarter. Because everything I just listed for you, if you took 10 minutes, you would have figured out what those things, those words indicated. But the algorithm does it faster than you do. And so the algorithm can now say, hey, 90% match for cutting. Try asking one of these questions. Or 90% match for substance abuse. Here are the three nearest drug clinics to your texter. Yeah, you should all be saying, wow, right now. It's a pretty big deal. OK. Um, so that is, that is how the science and data makes us better. I'm from New York. Humility is not my strong suit. OK. <laughs> now how does the data make the world better? So. Um, a couple of ways. So first, and I'm going to pull this up now behind me. I wasn't going to do this, but I saw these beautiful screens. And so I said, let's, um, let's pull this up real time. So can you guys, can we pull this up? How can I get this on the screen now behind me? I'm going to show you. We've taken the data. There it is. And we've mapped it for you. This is real time data. Here's substance abuse. Turns out substance abuse massively spikes at 5 AM. Think about if you run a hospital or you oversee an AA meeting or a family, this is information you need to know. Let's look at Christ. Let's pick another, uh, throw out another issue for me that you want to see by time of day. Bullying, time of day. There you go. Surprising for a lot of you that most of that is actually after school hours. It's actually sort of a homework time when people are online more when they're using social media more and they're a young person. Let's look at crisis by day of the week, LGBTQ issues. Turns out Friday is the best day to be gay in America. <laughs> here's, here's another one that's fascinating to me, day of the week, eating disorders. Eating disorders, a family issue, spikes in a big way on the weekends and Monday. Now I'm leading you up here to my map. Let's look at Colorado, shall we? The healthiest state. Substance abuse, apparently y'all have nailed that one. You're number 45 in the country. I know that's probably controversial. I'm going to move on quickly. OK. Um, <laughs> let's go to a really ugly one. Suicidal thoughts. Suicidal thoughts, Colorado. Oh, look, it refreshed since, no, that's eating disorder. Sorry, it's eating disorder, sorry. I, I, suicidal thoughts, here we go. Suicidal thoughts, you're number three. And the researchers in the room will draw their own conclusions, but let's just look what we're looking at here, patterns. Number one is Montana. Number two is Alaska. I know you had some people here from the Navajo Nation yesterday, and they are not surprised by the data that I'm showing you on this screen. So the healthiest state. Let's see where you're at for uh, eating disorders. I see a lot of things about health. OK, 35. Um, let's do one more. Let's see, uh, well, depression's going to be similar. Let's see anxiety. Anxiety's pretty good, too. That might have a relationship to your substance abuse point. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we can, we can pull this one down now, and I'm going to, so this is, I'll just, I'll leave that there. Or you can keep, even backstage, if you want to keep um, scrolling through, or you can all look at your computers. This, you can just spend time with this. This is open to the public. So this is a website. It's called crisistrends.org. Um, I encourage you to, to play with this. We've put this here for you. We want police departments, school boards, researchers, foundations. We want you to have access to this data. We want you to be able to come back next year and say, we are the healthiest state. And look how we improved in suicidal thoughts. We're not number three anymore. Um, so I, I, this is a gift. Uh, what we also realized what something you talked about yesterday, people want neighborhood level data though. This is very interesting for Colorado wide, but those police departments and school boards need more local data than that. So we have opened up a keyword partnership. Um, Atlanta is the first city to sign on. Los Angeles is days away from signing on. Um, you'll be able to text ATL to 741741. That's our number. 
and then we'll be able to have a juicier data set that's just Atlanta. We're doing this with locations. I'd be happy to do this for key markets here in Colorado. Oh, and by the way, it's free. I'd rather you spend your money promoting it than paying us for it. Uh, we're also doing it by issue area. So we've just locked a partnership with NIDA, the National Eating Disorders Association, where they will have their own keyword that they can promote. And we're trying to do this with uh, lots of communities. We've been talking to the Honor Violence Forced Marriage Community. Believe it or not, that is a community. There are 30 organizations in this space. There's become an acute problem of not only kids being trafficked into the United States, but American youth being trafficked outside the United States. So your parents come here from Afghanistan. You are born in this country. You are an American. You turn 14, 15 years old, and your parents look at you and say, I don't like the music you're listening to. I don't like the clothes you're wearing. Let's take a family trip back to Afghanistan to see our roots. And you land, and they marry you off to someone. This is happening, actually, quite a bit. This community is interested in a keyword with us to promote at airports and bus stops. It makes perfect sense. So second level data is going to be um, hyper local and hyper issue. We're pretty excited about that. The third level is for researchers. We have heard from more than 20 academics around the country who are dying to get their hands on our data because we not only have conversation level data, we have message level data. Each message you can see how someone changed within a conversation. If a counselor says this word, the texture responds this way. Here's how they move from a hot moment to a cool moment. This is actually one of the largest public health data sets that exists in this country. And we're opening up for researchers that's going to be available starting in January. We've set up our own ethics committee and uh, we'll be reviewing proposals. And if there are people in this room who want to look at message level data in the state of Colorado on certain issues or compare it to other places, we welcome that research because we want what we do to lead to long-term solutions and prevention. I am not, as I said earlier, a mental health activist. I have been incredibly surprised and humbled by what I've learned by doing this. What I bring to this space is technology and data. And I'm really interested now in Q&A to hear from you what's interesting about this. And I'm excited to learn, because you are health experts. So I have a lot to learn from you about how we could do this smarter and bigger. Thank you. Could, uh, do, do you guys know the drill on questions? So there are index cards on the tables. If you could fill them out. Um, I have some, I'd rather have yours. So put them at the ends of the tables and people can hand them up here. We have about 25 minutes, which is a great amount of time for questions. So please send them up soon and we'll get them going. Um, there's so much in there that's fascinating. <laughs> I almost don't know where to start. But if we could talk a little bit about what you've learned Something in all these things you've done has not worked as planned. Can you talk a little bit about what did not turn out the way you wanted it to, what you tried and immediately pulled back because you were getting bad reactions from the kids you were talking with, or any aspect of that? Fortunately, we haven't had any, oh, it hasn't worked well with the textures. I mean, we're a tech company. There have been a couple of times where we've you know, shipped code and there was a bug in it. Not often, because we're pretty good about user testing. Oh, by the way, one of my favorite organizations I just like plugging when I talk about testing is an organization called Specialist Guild. Um, and if anyone does anything in technology, they should use Specialist Guild. This is an organization it's a, that has taken autistic um, young people, mostly teens and 20-somethings, and taught them how to do QA testing. Um, QA testing is just reviewing code to make sure it's not buggy, to make sure it works in every browser. And so you literally get back a spreadsheet of it works in IE8, it works in IE7, it works in IE6, whatever. And, and here's where the bugs are. It's very meticulous. And basically, it's job training for young autistic people. And then they go get jobs at Google and Facebook and things like this. But um, it's really a great way to, if, if anyone is writing any code for you or you're shipping code, ask them to use Specialist Guild. It's a terrific organization and really effective. So we don't often ship buddy, buggy code. Um, uh, gosh, stuff that really hasn't worked. I mean, when we hired all of these crisis 
um, co communities, counselors, centers, um, these 11, I was really surprised at how diverse their training was and their philosophies. So backtracking from that, you can imagine, hasn't, hasn't been awesome. Um, right. We're essentially having to fire a bunch of crisis centers that were really excited about this. Um, another thing that's been a challenge is fragmentation in the space. Uh, there's a lot of competition in the not-for-profit sector, and uh, people don't always collaborate nicely. So instead of, I'm giving people keywords to do this for, and doing this for free, and they're still creating their own text lines. It's an ego thing, or a, someone gave us money to do this, so we're going to do it. And I've been saying, spend the money on promoting it so more people in need see it. Don't spend the money on trying to build the code or hiring someone else to do it for you. So that's been a little frustrating. What about the messaging that you're doing with the people you're communicating with? How are you learning in real time about that? Obviously, you want researchers to take this and do yeah. even more with it. And you say you're not a you're a mental health activist. You're not a mental health expert, as you said. I don't know that I'm either at this point. Well, but, yeah. but you're you're clearly making all these connections for people. But how do you are you doing changing things as you go? Yeah. As you learn a message that's not working, it says, "Oh, don't say that. That's not working." And we're really getting a bad reaction. Yeah, and we can we can change that. We can iterate okay. really quickly because we we can see it. We get the feedback. So, um, so the I statements were one. Um, we really train our people in active listening. And we're really just mirroring. We're not diagnosing. We are not doctors. Um, uh, actually, only 4% of the conversations end in a referral somewhere else to get a rape kit or to go to a drug clinic or to see a doctor. Um, most of the conversations, 96% of the conversations, are really just people in hot moments who already have a doctor um, and just need to be brought from a hot moment to a cool moment. I should also add, 2 thirds of our volume comes in one third of the day. It's at night. By far, this is at night. So these are people who may already have other care and other action plans, but at night they're alone and having a hot moment and they just need us to text with. One of the questions from the audience is how, and I had this question myself, um, thinking about how my kids communicate. You have kids, they're um, native with many kinds of technology, so I'm personally curious what your, what your home rules are in technology. We'll get back to that in a second. <laughs> but how do you keep up as an organization with changes in technology in, I mean, kids are going, they still like texting, uh -huh. but texting has peaked yep. in terms of overall use. So there's you know, Snapchat, there's Vine, there's so many different methods out there. Um, WhatsApp, I'm curious what your relationship with is with that. So WhatsApp doesn't have what's called an API. We've talked to them. They don't have an API, so it's not, um, it's not open. You can't build on top of it. Okay. Facebook Messenger, I, I sent two of our developers were at F8, the big Facebook developer conference in February, and they announced that they will be opening up an API later this year. So we do plan on offering this. My guess is in late 2016, maybe early 2017, by Facebook Messenger. A couple things about that. One is it's totally free. Um, the problem with that is we will be immediately global uh, because Facebook Messenger, the thing about text is we can really, we can only service USA and now if you're a T-Mobile user, Canada and, and Mexico, but other than T-Mobile, they're just, it's just a USA short code and functionality, SMS, but Facebook Messenger doesn't care where you live. So we could start getting people messaging us from Riyadh. I don't know where to get a rape kit in Saudi Arabia. I don't know what the rules and regulations are. So we're trying to prepare ourselves for that. But we have built the platform knowing that we're going to have to pivot to what's called the OTTs, the over-the-tops uh, messaging platforms. Those are not going away. I, I don't think text is really going to die. I mean, people thought the fax machine was going to kill everything also. And then they thought email was going to kill the fax machine. I still get faxes. Um, so. And nobody still knows how to send a fax. That's so true. But at least it doesn't problem. make that awful sound anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, when you talk about that global pressure, uh, do you, and let's go back to, you mentioned a briefly about languages and what you're doing about that or what you can't do about it. So let's talk more about that. Colorado, large Hispanic population, large Spanish only speaking population, or yep. Spanish first. Yep. So tell us more about what you guys are thinking on that. Um, so it's, it, we are, we're trying to figure this one out. What's really interesting is even people speak a little bit of English, you're less embarrassed about your English by texting it. Mm. First of all, everybody texts spelling errors and abbreviations. It's sort of normal to text poor grammar and um, bad spelling and, and, again, short words. Mm -hmm. So And no one will, will hear. So a lot of people who are self-conscious about their English are much com more comfortable doing this by text, which is terrific. Um, and we actually, we've only had um, like not even two dozen people probably ask us about offering this in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, it is skewing younger. You have younger people 
are speaking English at faster rates than older people, um, and we happen to skew young. We don't cut off older people. We're oddly having a lot of people texting in about their own divorce, about their children. I think my son might be addicted to pot. How, what do I do? So um, we'd love to figure out a way to offer this in Spanish. I'd love to also be able to, we want the algorithm to also work and to be able to strip, again, the same words, um, catch severity, all of that. Okay. We're kind of surprised that it hasn't been a bigger issue. Thanks for that. And so making connections to other speakers as well. Um, Dr. Ivor Horn, who's African American, spoke yesterday about her communities and that she's worked with and that um, she mentioned a group called Black Girls Code uh -huh. that, I know. Is, I know that she's working with. Great. Um, and that the perception um, and the reality when you go when you walk into Twitter's headquarters, it's oh very gosh. white. It's almost as white as this. <laughs> Ouch. Um, moving on. Um, but, I'm from New York. I'm from New York. But she said the users, yeah. the use of Twitter oh my gosh. is much more black brown, Twitter. brown, black, other Black colors. Twitter is a thing. Yes. Black Twitter is so much more interesting than the rest of Twitter. So I wanted you to expand on that when you talk about it in texting, in that yeah. the different communities' comfort levels with different kinds of technology and communication and how that's an So this advantage. is again, this is again from the Pew Charitable Trust. Pew does the best research that we've seen on um, people and their digital habits. And they will tell you, so you, you referenced uh, 60 is the mean. Um, so we're actually seeing higher numbers than that in the, in the most recent Pew studies. Um, and that African American youth and Hispanic youth text a lot more um, than other kids. Um, they don't have their own personal home computers. They're not doing emails much. Some of them have um, phones that maybe have smartphone, but they haven't enabled the smartphone plan because it's more expensive. So they are texting even at higher rates. So it's super important. Um, and I think a lot of health organizations are starting to realize there's a, for example, a diabetes program where you can text and you can get um, information about your diabetes by text. Um, I don't know if you all know Text for Baby. Um, where, you're, where um, pregnant women, yeah, can get uh, advice. We've actually been talking to Paul at Text for Baby at Voxiva, which owns it, because he's seen our platform and has said, it would be so great if we could be interactive. Right now, Text for Baby just sends you like, hey, take your prenatal vitamin, quit smoking, sends you advice, but wouldn't it be great if it could be interactive the way Crisis Text Line is? So if you care about low income and minority populations, you should be looking pretty seriously at using texting for case management, for all kinds of things. Okay, so and you had mentioned in the talk that you were partnering with local communities, mm -hmm. um, trying to get data even more local. So if people in this group wanted to get a DEN designation. Let's do it. So how does it get done? Tell, tell just, us all what we done. need to do. <laughs> Great, we're done. See, we've accomplished something at the conference. It just got done. We can absolutely do it. Um, uh, so we uh, believe in, we're an open organization and we use as much open source code as possible. So what we would do is um, I would put you in touch with the person on my team who actually runs these partnerships. There are thresholds. So you could start texting DEN to 741741 right now and we'll start um, with the data set. My suggestion to you is that you actually promote it that you work together to promote it in bus stops or school bathrooms and things like that because once we have the volume, velocity, and variety, we can make you a DEN version of crisistrends.org. Okay. But not until we have enough volume, velocity, and variety because you can't protect the personally identifiable information of individual texters until you have the volume, velocity, and variety in place. So once you hit thresholds, we can make that, and then every, it's not like I'm going to have to send you a monthly report. Y'all will be able to go online to crisistrends.org slash DEN and see it any time you want, real time. And all of you will be able to work on the same data set, which will also be exciting for fostering a conversation. So our job would be to promote it, uh, let people know about it, communicate it Use out it. there to everybody. And the other thing would be, for those of you who are thinking about doing this or funding this, don't fragment the data by starting something else. If you fund a different text line in Denver or in Colorado, now you're going to have users going to two different places, which means the data set is less pure. So now you understand why I'm giving this out for free everywhere. I'm trying to stem off the fragmentation of data. 
We really want everybody to go through 741, 741. And by the way, you don't have to say crisis text line. You could just say Denver has a text line. It's text DEN to 741, 741. I don't care if our branding is on there or anything. I just want to make sure all the data is going through the same place. I'm also happy if there are Denver um, health experts who want to look at our training so that you feel really confident that we're saying the right things. And if you want to help us figure out Spanish, let's do it. How would they do that? How could they look over your shoulder at your training? Um, we can, I mean, I'm happy to open it up for you, okay. for you to see the training. They could go through the modules, training, right? And it would be even better if we got people from Colorado to actually become crisis counselors. That would okay. be awesome. Because that's the one thing that holds us back from growth even more, is we just need more crisis counselors. I will tell you our best crisis counselors, this is interesting, are veterans. Veterans are phenomenal crisis counselors. They make their shifts on time. They have an intense sense of duty. Do we have veterans in the room? Okay, thank you, first of all, to the veterans who are in the room. And the veterans just, wow, when there is a spike and we hit the spike team button, it's the veterans who are on there with that spirit of, we've got this, we can do this. It becomes almost like competitive, right? So it feeds that kind of a spirit. It's pretty fantastic. So we're always looking for more veterans. I will also tell you, 20-something lesbians, they are great counselors too. I don't know why. I, I don't know you why. Don't it's not my job. Okay. It's not my job to know why. I'm just telling you those <laughs> are our two. If we find a 27 le something lesbian who's also a veteran, we have hit gold. <laughs> 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 but those are our two best crisis counselors. So if you know either or both, please send them my way. So if Denver promotes, you know, the crisis line in general or a specific um, tag on it, I, that leads me back to how the kids who are texting you know that you're there. I mean, how does the average kid know it's 11.30, they're feeling upset, yeah. they're depressed. How do they know the 741? Where I, did it come from? Right, right. because we didn't promote it. We're right. not doing like public service announcements with celebrities standing in front of, you know, gray screens saying something sad. We're not doing that. We're not, we're not taking out Facebook ads. And we're not to, there's been zero marketing. We're not even taking out Google AdWords, and they've given us free AdWords, and we've just said we can't use them yet. So here's what's happened. About uh, two months ago, it was in May, um, all of a sudden, we had a huge spike. And um, we posted on social media, like, what's going on? Why are we getting such a spike? Turns out we were number one on Reddit that day. Anybody on uh, Reddit? And the way that we got to be number one on Reddit was a couple of days earlier, someone posted something lovely about us on something called Imager. How many of you have even heard of Imager? Right, Imager's like a, sort of like a Tumblr. And, they, and someone posted something that said, my anxiety prevents me from speaking with a human. But I found this thing, 741, 741, and it's the best therapy I've ever had. Hmm. That was shared 600,000 times in 24 hours. Then it went to Tumblr, where it had over 30,000 comments. And from there, it was on Reddit. We had no control over that. We had no idea. We didn't even know who the person was who posted it originally. Um, this is what happens when you provide great care. How, how does a restaurant become super popular? I guess they could take lots of advertising, or they could serve you really, really delicious food at a fair price, and then you tell all your friends about it. I mean, that's, it's the best compliment, especially when you're dealing with young people, that if they like you enough to tell, you, tell their friends about you. And so that's how we have been growing. What's hard about it is that it's unpredictable. I don't know when someone's going to say something nice about us. So the spikes come kind of at weird times. So we have a few questions about uh, that relate to age. Thank you. Um, that in terms of, I guess some people wonder if you have almost a cutoff, but more just mm -hmm. a question of what I'm more interested in, and I think the group would be more interested in um, how it breaks down. Do you know how many people over 25? I also want to know how you know that. At some point, do you text them back and say, so how old are you? Or okay. so what two, do you ask them? So two different things here. One is be, um, we made the decision very early on. Anybody remember the original Tron movie? This is proving how yeah. geeky I am. OK, so uh, fight for the user. Right, that is painted on our wall. Thank you, one other nerdy woman here. OK, good. <laughs> so <laughs> she's nodding. You know what I'm talking about. The original Tron. So um, fight for the user is painted on our wall. We have decided that we are here <coughs> for the user. And to us, that's the texture and the crisis counselor. We're not here for our funders. I'm not here for the government. We're here to help people. And so because of that, we don't start with an intake survey. How old are you? What's your race? Where are you texting in from? Because that is super annoying to the texter who is suicidal and just wants help. 
And it's frankly kind of frustrating for the crisis counselor too, because the crisis counselor is there because he or she wants to provide help. So to have to go through that annoying intake survey is just preventing the crisis counselor from delivering something valuable. We also don't ask that stuff, yeah. So we also don't ask that stuff because we can scrape it anyway. <laughs> so thanks to the data and the algorithm, we can figure all that stuff out. So um, the number one place that is referenced is the word school. 60% of our texters reference school. So we have a general uh, set for them. Um, another 35% references home. Those are our two most popular places. We can kind of get age. We can kind of get uh, socioeconomic status because the first three digits, obviously, of your mobile number correspond to those 295 area codes I was talking about. But did you know that the second three digits correspond to about 32,000 zip codes in the United States? So we know a lot of, about you. But we were using it for good, not evil. <laughs> so we know, we know a lot of good about you. So um, most of our texters are young people. We're getting people of all ages. We would never cut them off. But, um, and, and our rule, fight for the user, is don't ask for information from a user that A, isn't valuable to the user, and B, we could figure out anyway. Like, why do that? So you mentioned schools, and one of the questions is about working um, with school districts or at least communicating with school districts. Um, is there any such thing? Uh, how do school districts fit into this? A lot of them, have, as this questioner points out, a lot of schools have done a great job, in Colorado especially, of having a mental health center yes. and having access to mental health. So yes. how do we I'm so that? glad that schools are now really taking this seriously, especially colleges. Um, so Palo Alto has had an acute youth suicide problem. Um, They've had something like six or seven um, suicides of teenagers in the high schools there. There are two main high schools in Palo Alto in the last school year. And um, we've been talking with them. You would think that if any community would want to embrace a tech solution, it would be Palo Alto. Um, we've been talking with them, and we've also run the numbers on some things. Again, I'm not the researcher, but we did look and say, what are the three most popular keywords that we're getting from people in and around Palo Alto? And two of them were like everyone else in the country, school and friends. Two. The third most popular word that we get in Palo Alto that doesn't show up in most other communities in the United States, mom. And any, have you gleaned any meaning from that yet? So not my job right. to draw the conclusions. My job to give the principals and the academics and the families there the knowledge that mom is part of the pressure these suicidal kids are feeling. And now all the mothers in the room are like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so how often do you get SAT from Palo Alto or anywhere else in SAT, the country? Like SATs? Well, no, like oh. the, just uh, how often does that word show up? I mean, we're talking oh. about academic pressure, we're talking about test pressure, we're yeah. talking about I'm depressed because I didn't get into X. Uh, we get some of that, um, okay. not, as not, not as much as you would think. Okay. No, not as much as you think. Again, because we're, um, we're a perfect map of the US and then skew a couple of percentage points higher for low income and minority. Hmm. Um, and those aren't the primary concerns. They're like, um, they're much more concerned about family issues. They're much more concerned that we're seeing, at least in the data, about um, economic things also. Um, yeah. Although we did start seeing suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts, spiking in the middle of the school day starting in the end of March. Um, people tend to think of back to school as the most stressful time. It, I mean, it's, it is a stressful time, but we saw middle of the school day acceptance suicidal thoughts. Day. In, well, it's college acceptance, it's um, uh, uh, financial aid packages, it's prom. And for a lot of low-income students, you're looking soon at the end of the school year. You don't know what you're going to be doing in the summer. You don't know where you're going to be getting lunch. You don't necessarily have a job. It is a very, the end of the school year is actually, we're seeing more stressful than the start of the school year. Hmm. But again, not, not my, I'm not gonna draw all those conclusions. I, would, I welcome researchers to pile in. We've had a couple questions about privacy issues. And yes. I know you've also talked publicly about pressure, not just from researchers, but I'm sure Major corporations would love to have your data to sell something to somebody. So you have to make decisions about that. You talked about an ethics committee. Um, there's a question here about employers um, and insurance companies, other people getting information that Military. they might not use yep. for the greater good. So mm -hmm. how do you protect your information? So um, again, because our philosophy in our is fight for the user, and we are here for the user, um, that is the most important thing. So early on when I had the idea, I had some hedge fund people tell me that they would buy the data because they could trade off the data. 
and no different things going on, and I just said, wow, you're kind of a jerk, no. So, um, <laughs> no, that's like, that's not what this is for. Um, I, I definitely, um, fortunately there are rules about this, but I definitely have concerns about insurance companies spending time on crisis trends and redlining various states or types of people. Um, that would not be awesome, um, but there are rules about that, thank goodness. Um, think about that in election season, that's all I'm gonna say. Um, <laughs> And um, so the privacy of the user really is foremost to us, um, even if it's at the detriment of, of revenue streams. Um, everything is encrypted, uh, so we haven't had that issue. Um, I, I don't know what else to say, except that this is our utmost. We do what's called white hat and black hat testing um, at least once a year. That's basically inviting people to hack your system. It seems It's basically like a vaccine. You know how sometimes people are like, wait, you're giving me a small dose of the measles. No, no, it's a vaccine. That's basically what white and black hat testing is for tech. It's like a tiny little dose of a problem and to see if you can handle it. So we do all of and that. you survived those? Yeah, so yes. Um, and we've really, I mean, that's when, when your number one concern is the texture, it's not an afterthought. Amazingly, you build great products. You build products that give them great service and deliver. You give them products that are uh, protect their privacy and value them first. I didn't come at this because someone gave us $10 million to do it. We started building it before we had the money. So it's never been directed by the money or directed um, even by the data. It was always, how do we help that girl who's being raped by her father? And she is the most important thing to us. So funding is also important though, and so that allows us to ask a question from one of the participants. Where um, do I send a check, is that the question? Uh, well, that's, impl <laughs> that's implied in the question. Uh, the question is actually, how are you funded? So they didn't all in write- In all caps, I like that, like shouting, it. that's good. I can write underneath it the address for the check. Right, exactly. Um, so, but, so tell us about that. So it's, um, first of all, it's incredibly cost effective, right? So you think about even what I mentioned before, so it's all cloud-based. Um, and the training is all cloud-based, so we have trainers can train 50 people at a time in these cohorts. Um, the application, we do automated background checks, we do an empathy check, excuse me, but a lot of the stuff depends on an algorithm. It's pretty great. So technology not only makes you faster and better, it should also make you cheaper in general. That's really what technology does. So you're looking at, for the scope of what I'm talking about, we're looking at like a four and a half million budget this year, and probably a six million dollar budget next year. This is not a lot of money. Having said that, Every foundation was like, oh, this is so new. You don't fit any of our buckets. You know the whole bucket thing? And, so, and I would look at them and be like, you just, of course, we're new. We don't fit an old bucket. Like, that's, you just said it. So That's these guys right here. It's really a challenge. New things are very hard. How many people have struggled to get a new thing funded? Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking about it because you feel my pain. <laughs> so it's hard, so uh, I convinced a couple of um, individuals, and, and really I went to Ron Johnson when he was the CEO of JCPenney, and convinced him to put us at the register. Um, and so it was basically, there's an idea for this, do you wanna help make it happen? And we crowdsourced in nickels and dimes and quarters from the last remaining JCPenney customers. Um, <laughs> we, they're doing better, they're doing so much better, and I'm grateful to them forever. They raised $1.4 million to the register, so those JCPenney customers. So I always tell everybody, if you need socks and underwear, please go buy it at a JCPenney. Um, or anything else. Okay, so um, so then, and then I convinced a couple of wealthy individuals, and now that we've got such great results, and the data is there, we're starting to get some love from um, a few foundations. But it has been harder to raise the money than I would think. I'm supposed to be good at this. You read that like very kind bio about me. You'd think I'd know how to raise money. Apparently, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> it's it's been much harder to raise the money than it should be. Okay, well, we'll see if we can help. Um, sorry, we have to wrap up. Um, You're gonna stop after that? Yeah. That was so good. I, I didn't. <laughs> you can donate that. online. <laughs> No, actually, I wrote down to uh, remind everybody here to write themselves down, 741741, yeah. right, for the actual line. Uh, crisistrends.org yep. is, and remind us what you get when you go to that spot. Why I mean, would we go there? Has anybody been on that, like, while I've been sitting up here? Yeah, pretty cool, right? Yeah, yeah. You, all the data is there and open and in real time. Enjoy. Um, and, uh, and let's do Denver, at the very least. Let's do Denver together. Nancy, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Love to hear what you're talking about. Thank you. And everybody else, there we go. We're going to take a 15-minute break, so try to be back here at 10 o'clock. <laughs>